Today, Colorado's gun laws got stricter. Democratic Governor Jared Polis signed four gun bills into law today. It's been months since a mass shooting in Colorado Springs and just weeks after second shooting at Denver's East High School. 90s reporter Jennifer Meckles shows us how we got here and the impacts. We have a number of bills that I'm going to sign today that will help make Colorado one of the 10 safest states in the country. It is a bold promise from Colorado's Democratic leadership, a promise they hope to realize with four newly signed laws. It's official. Congratulations. After months of shootings across Colorado and public outrage over so many losses to gun violence. And not to forget the students from East High and from across the state who showed up time after time to remind us of the urgency of this work, to demand action on these important pieces of legislation. One law requires a three-day waiting period for gun purchases. Another raises the minimum age to purchase any gun in Colorado to 21. One expands the state's red flag laws, and a fourth makes it easier for victims of gun violence to sue the firearm industry. We finally, after 23 years of waiting, can open up Colorado courtrooms to gun violence victims and survivors seeking justice. But easier to sue makes gun sellers nervous. We're doing everything that we can and doing things right. And now by this bill, if a product that we happen to sell is used illicitly, um, it is very easy for somebody to come back and lump us into a lawsuit um, and expose us to civil liability. Jacqueline and Brian Clark own Bristlecone Shooting Training and Retail Center in Lakewood. They said they can adjust their business model around new age limits and a waiting period, but the lawsuit risk isn't so simple. We run our business in an upstanding and conservative and safe way, you know, so it doesn't change our day to day operations. What it does change is when I lay my, de my head down on my <laughs> pillow at night, whether or not I can sleep. You know, is there somebody out there who may use something that I've sold in a bad way? And, and I didn't sell it to them with any knowledge of that. But is it in five or 10 or 15 years down the road going to come back to bite me? Now, of course, is the opposition, right? Rocky Mountain gun owners have already filed a lawsuit against two of the four bills today, calling them unconstitutional and are considering legal action against the other two laws. And Republican leadership in the state house has criticized the bill, saying in part, Democrats want to punish the majority for the tragic actions of a few. Well, you we know, Rocky Mountain gun owners act fast and they certainly prove that today. Yes, they do. Yes, All right, Jenny. Thanks. Police need help finding who killed two people at work at a restaurant on Monday. Reward for information is being increased. Denver Coroner's Office says 34-year-old Emerald Vaughn Daler, 58-year-old Ignacio Gutierrez Morales were shot dead inside American Elm Restaurant. The number for Denver Metro Crime Stoppers for anyone with information is 720-913-7867. As always, you can stay anonymous if you provide a tip. Police have released very little about this shooting or any potential suspects. They're now offering a $5,000 reward for more information. Deputies in Parker gave the all clear after an entire high school had to be evacuated for a bomb threat. The Douglas County Sheriff's Office said there was a bomb threat at Chaparral High School this afternoon. It's about 1230. They began clearing out the school. Students realized they were released about 115 because of how long the search would take. By four this afternoon, deputies said no suspicious devices were found. Still unclear tonight where that threat came from. It's already a class one misdemeanor in Colorado to make false reports of bomb threats. A new bill going through the state legislature right now would increase penalties for false reports of mass shootings. If passed, it would make it a felony offense to knowingly falsely report a mass shooting in Colorado. A committee advanced the bill yesterday. It already passed the full Senate and now to the full House. The Denver Public Schools principal who first told Nine News how students facing criminal charges up to attempted murder are put right back in class, that man may now face an investigation himself. His attorney told our Chris Vanderveen today, if the district retaliates against McAuliffe Principal Kurt Dennis, DPS should get ready for a lawsuit. Are you mad? Yeah, frustrated. Inside Denver's largest middle school, its leader told us something he knew put his job at risk. You're aware of that? Yeah. You okay with that? Yeah. It's important. Kurt Dennis wanted us to know that daily he and his staff had to do something neither he nor his staff was trained to do. Pat down a student accused of attempted murder. The school district told you because this attempted murder took place off school grounds, it doesn't impact his life on school grounds. Correct. One month later, his attorney says those words have now led to this. Pursuant to his appearing on camera with you, 
DPS has launched a full-scale investigation of him. Which is why this morning, at 6.41 a.m. to be precise, David Lane sent this email to the DPS superintendent and board of education. It was filled with some legalese and case law, but in essence, it said this. Basically, if you touch one little principal hair on his little principal head, you'll be in federal court explaining to a federal judge why you're violating his First Amendment freedom of speech. Lane says should DPS move against Principal Dennis, he will move against the district. Instead of looking at their policy about allowing violent kids to remain in school, Instead, they're focusing all their attention on going after Kurt with his bogus investigation, looking for excuses to discipline him. Kurt Dennis's words to us came shortly after another pat down led to a double shooting inside East High School. He didn't want a repeat of that inside his school. Today, parents of his students said they're watching this as well. And the fact that you know he would lose his job and his ability to provide for his family because he stood up for them and for their safety is crazy. If he were to lose his job because of it, I think we're really teaching our kids how the system's broken. A DPS spokesperson told us the district has not seen a formal complaint, so we are not able to comment on that situation. A spokesperson for the board told us the potential investigation is an operational matter and not under the purview of the Board of Education. We have spoken with numerous DPS school administrators who share the same concerns as Principal Dennis. They've said that they don't feel safe enough to talk to us about what's going on. And they said they're watching to see how the district handles the first whistleblower. Nine News and other media are suing Denver Public Schools to reveal what happened behind closed doors during a school board executive session. Following the shooting at East High School last month, the board met privately for four and a half hours. We don't know what they said, but they came out with a memo instructing the superintendent to bring school resource officers back to Denver classrooms. The lawsuit is an effort to make the private recordings public. School board vice president Ayante Anderson was reprimanded by the board president for revealing just some of what was said during that session. Anderson says the board voted unanimously to welcome SROs back to campus because Superintendent Alex Marrero told them Mayor Michael Hancock was prepared to do so through an executive order. The mayor's office denies ever drafting an order or threatening one. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Denver today for the City Summit of the Americas. He met with the mayor of Kiev, Ukraine, and he toured the Denver Police Lab, and then he sat down with our Marshal Zellinger. Given that Secretary Blinken is in charge of any kind of sticky international issue for the U.S., Marshall asked Secretary Blinken if he'd been looped in at all on the mysterious absence of Avstar Val Nechuskin, who's a Russian citizen. This is news to me, so to best of my knowledge, no. Um, now, I have, to, I have to acknowledge, just in case there are any conspiracy theories out there, I am a New York Rangers fan. When would something like this reach your office? In, in all seriousness, if there was some kind of uh, legitimate international concern, involving another country, of course, that's something that, uh, that we'd be seized with. Nechuskin left Seattle hours before game three, no explanation as to why or where he's going, and the abs are still without him tonight for game six. A Seattle police report on the incident is, it's odd. The report says team employees went to check on Nechuskin at the team hotel before game three and instead found a heavily intoxicated woman in his room. The team doctor called 911. He was concerned the woman couldn't leave safely. An off-duty Denver police officer traveling with the team told Seattle police that there were no reports of any crime involving the woman. The report says there's no relation between the woman and Nechuskin. It lists the relationship as unknown. The woman told authorities that she is from Russia and told an officer that a quote-unquote bad person took her passport from her. Avs head coach Jared Bednar continues to say that Nechuskin's sudden absence is just a personal matter. 